Welcome to the 214th meeting of the National Council on the Arts. Good morning, everyone. That was an excerpt from last month's National Heritage Fellowships Award Ceremony featuring Detroit Brooks on banjo and 2008 NEA Heritage Fellow, Dr. Michael White on clarinet, playing an original piece titled Heritage Bounce. This piece was composed by Dr. White specifically for last month's ceremony. The 214th meeting of the National Council on the Arts is now in session. I'm Maria Rosario Jackson, Chair of the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm a woman with dark curly hair, rectangular large glasses. I'm wearing black clothing and a necklace of pearls. Greetings from San Juan, Puerto Rico, where I am with a team of NEA staff participating in the annual meeting of the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies, as well as a chapter meeting of the International Federation of Arts Councils and Culture Agencies, all happening in San Juan. Thank you to NASA and Instituto de Cultura Puerto Riqueña staff for being fantastic hosts to the NEA team here. Before we start with our regular business, let's pause to focus on our colleagues and fellow citizens who've been impacted by Hurricanes Helene and Milton. We know that cultural institutions, arts organizations and artists have without a doubt been deeply affected by the severe flooding and damage in Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee and Virginia. Please note that in addition to our regular engagement with state and regional arts organizations, we've taken proactive measures with our colleagues at FEMA, as well as our state arts agency partners. In communication with them, we're getting a better understanding of the impact of the storms on the arts community, and we're assessing what support is needed immediately and longer term. Please keep all of those affected in your thoughts. 
Welcome, members of the National Council on the Arts, arts leaders, NEA staff, and everyone joining us today. Thank you for making time to participate. National Council on the Arts members joining us virtually are Aaron Dworkin of Michigan, Bitta Becker of Navajo Nation, Bruce Carter of Florida, Christopher Morgan of California, Connie Williams of Pennsylvania, Deepa Gupta of Illinois, Fiona Whelan Prine of Tennessee, Gretchen Gonzalez Davidson of Michigan, Waskar Medina of Kansas, Ishmael Ahmed of Michigan, Jake Shinbukuro of Hawaii, Camilla Forbes of New York, Keenan Azme of New York, Maria Lopez de Leon of Texas, Michael Lombardo of California, Paul Holtz of New Hampshire, Rani Ramaswamy of Minnesota. Absent today is Anil Kang of New York. As a reminder, the National Endowment for the Arts is an independent federal agency established by Congress in 1965, charged with making arts available to all Americans. By advancing equitable opportunities for arts participation and practice, the NEA fosters and sustains an environment in which the arts benefit everyone in the United States. In this capacity, we act as a grant maker and as a national resource. Through our work as a grant maker, convener, connector, catalyst, we help to bolster arts and culture in all communities across the country. The National Council on the Arts advises on agency policies, programs, and grants. For our first order of business, can I get a motion to approve the minutes of the June 2024 council meeting? So moved. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Thank you. Now, please welcome Ayana Hudson, Chief Strategy, Programs, and Engagement Officer at the National Endowment for the Arts. Thank you, Chair Jackson, and good morning, everyone. I'm an African-American, middle-aged female with shoulder-length black hair and bangs. I'm wearing black rim glasses, brown lipstick, a multicolored turtleneck, and a blue suit jacket. Council members, we will proceed with the application review section of the agenda. The tally of the votes will be announced at the end of today's session. The council will be voting by ballot today on award recommendations, totaling more than $47 million in three funding areas, grants for arts projects, creative writing fellowships, and national initiatives. These funding recommendations are found in the corresponding sections of the council book. For your vote to be tallied, you must be present at the time of the motion, discussion, and vote. Council members, you must email your votes to Kim Jefferson in this category immediately at the conclusion of this part of the meeting. Council members' affiliations are recorded on the council pages and each member has been provided an opportunity to update this information prior to the meeting. Council members are recorded as not voting on applications with which they are affiliated. This list becomes part of the agency's official record. May I have a motion to consider the recommended grants and rejections under grants for arts projects, creative writing fellowships, and national initiatives in the council book? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Now we'll summarize the funding areas on which you will be voting. Grants for arts projects, or GAP, is the largest grants program of the National Endowment for the Arts providing comprehensive and expansive funding opportunities to strengthen the nation's arts and cultural ecosystem. Through project-based funding, the program supports opportunities for public engagement with the arts and arts education, for the integration of the arts with strategies promoting the health and well-being of people and communities, and for the improvement of the overall capacity and capabilities within the arts sector. The agency welcomes applications from a variety of eligible organizations nonprofit organizations, units of state and local government, and federally recognized tribal communities or tribes, including first time applicants, organizations serving communities of all sizes, including rural and urban areas, and from organizations with small 
medium, or large operating budgets. The NEA is committed to diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, and fostering mutual respect for the diverse beliefs and values of all individuals and groups. We encourage projects that address any of the following. Contribute to a healthy and thriving local, regional, statewide, and national arts and culture ecosystem. Elevate artists as integral and essential to a healthy and vibrant society. Celebrate the nation's creativity and or cultural heritage. Facilitate cross-sector collaborations that center the arts at the intersection of other disciplines, sectors, and industries. Support arts projects with a focus on advancing the health and well-being of individuals and communities. Invest in organizational capacity building and leadership development for arts organizations, arts workers, and artists. Support existing and new technology-centered creative practices across all artistic disciplines and forms, as well as build arts organizations' capacity to serve a broad public by providing access, training, and other resources to engage with digital technologies. Develop creative work, exploring the impacts of artificial intelligence, or AI, in a way that is consistent with valuing human artistry. Projects may include artistic work from across all artistic disciplines that improves the public's awareness or understanding of the responsible use of AI in the field of the arts. Originate from or are in collaboration with the following constituencies encouraged by White House executive orders. Historically black colleges and universities, tribal colleges and universities, American Indian and Alaska Native tribes, predominantly Black institutions, Hispanic serving institutions, Asian American and Pacific Islander communities, and organizations that support the independence and lifelong inclusion of people with disabilities. To mark the 250th anniversary of the United States of America, the NEA also seeks arts projects to advance its mission of fostering and sustaining an environment in which the arts benefit everyone in the United States. The NEA is partnering with America 250 to encourage arts projects that educate and engage communities in dialogue about the past, the present, and the future of our nation. In February 2024, the agency received 2,195,000 ,000 eligible GAP applications, requesting more than $120 million in FY 2025 support. Recommended for the Council's approval are 1,136,000 projects, totaling more than $32 million. Grants are recommended to approximately 52% of all eligible applicants, with amounts ranging from $10,000 to $100,000, and an average grant amount of $28,261. Recommended projects span 15 disciplines and fields, Direct grants are recommended to 49 states, Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico. Please mark your ballot. The National Endowment for the Arts provides direct support to creative writers and literary translators of distinction through creative writing fellowships. Fellowships in poetry enable recipients to set aside time for writing, research, travel, and general career advancement. Fellowships for translation projects enable recipients to translate work from other languages into English. This year, a total of $875,000 is being recommended to 35 writers in creative writing poetry and $325,000 to 22 translators to translate works from 18 languages and 21 countries into English. Please mark your ballot. National initiatives support a wide variety of projects of national and fieldwide significance that provide opportunities for thousands of Americans to experience quality arts programming throughout the country. At this meeting, the council is requested to approve funding for 49 projects representing five disciplines, totaling more than $13.8 million. Support is requested for three cooperative agreements in support of the Creative Forces NEA Military Healing Arts Network, which provides creative arts therapies and arts engagement activities in clinical and community settings for service members, veterans, and families. Nine individuals and one group nominated to receive an NEA National Heritage Fellowship 
an award that honors American folk and traditional artists for their contributions to traditional art forms and to the American public through their artistic work. The production and management of public events for the National Endowment for the Arts National Heritage Fellowship Program, which annually honors the NEA National Heritage Fellows. Nine recommended projects under arts and health and well being, a new pilot program of the National Endowment for the Arts that will support the integration of arts and culture into strategies that seek to strengthen belonging and social connection as a dimension of improved health and well being of individuals and communities. A new capacity and network building initiative, the Local Arts Agency's National Cohort Program, designed to strengthen local arts agencies across the country. 18 recommended projects in NEA research grants in the arts, which support a broad range of arts-related studies. The renewal of five National Endowment for the Arts research labs, and finally, the renewal of the Sound Health Network Initiative, which regularly will convene experts in music, neuroscience, health, and wellness, and will identify and promote research findings. Please mark your ballot. Council members, you may now email your votes on those three categories to Kim Jefferson. And finally, we move to the award update section of the council book. These grants have been awarded under the chair's delegated authority and are brought to the council's attention at this meeting, but no vote is necessary. Included are seven interagency agreements and three 20% amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Ayana. As we near the end of the Biden-Harris administration, we have an opportunity to reflect on the accomplishments made over the past several years, the strengthened role of the National Endowment for the Arts, and to identify areas primed to evolve to meet demands for our time. Over the next few minutes, I'll explore some of the expanded and new ways we've been working. I'll allude to seeds we've planted that are beginning to take root as a result of this administration's historic support for the arts, and in many instances, in collaboration with those of you listening today. During this period of time, the arts sector and the communities we serve have faced significant challenges exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. For some dimensions of the sector, uncertainty and instability persist as audiences return continues to lag, production costs are on the rise, and arts leadership is transitioning with some leaders retiring and new perspectives entering. We're learning to navigate a creative world with more extensive use and access to artificial intelligence while striving to protect artists and their original work. We're experiencing a complex political reality that also impacts the cultural sector. And of course, there's more. At the same time, there's a greater appreciation for the role of the arts in shaping a stronger and more just society. Under the Biden-Harris administration, the federal government has taken unprecedented action to unleash the full power of the arts to bolster communities across the country. As President Biden honored the 2022 and 2023 recipients of the National Medal of Arts, he stated that the administration supports the arts and humanities as essential pieces of America's might and dynamism. President Biden has provided much needed COVID relief at a time when cultural organizations were especially vulnerable signed a seminal executive order that recognizes the power of the arts and calls upon the whole of government to increase collaboration with cultural agencies to integrate arts and culture into policies and strategies to address pressing challenges, and folded the arts into a number of initiatives designed to address isolation and promote mutual understanding and more. Fostered engagement with longtime champions of the arts in Congress and work to garner robust bipartisan support. We've also expanded our view of who should be, who can consider themselves a stakeholder in the cultural sector 
and have forged stronger bonds with key leaders across sectors and in various facets of the White House. Today, perhaps more than at any other time in its history, the NEA has expanded its role as a funder and resource with the understanding that our work impacts the arts sector and also our communities and our country. As a result, we're meeting mission through additional and new opportunities that support an environment where all Americans are able to engage with and benefit from the arts throughout their lives. We've prioritized strengthening the arts ecosystem, as well as advancing a more nuanced and holistic understanding of the value of the arts that allows us to deepen and create new collaborations and partnerships across diverse areas of policy and practice. And we've also prioritized helping to shape the future of the field. Knowing that none of us can do our best work or reach our full potential without the arts integrated. The NEA has been intentional in its work to advance the concept of artful lives. It calls for an elastic and inclusive understanding of the arts and arts participation that's not static. It includes the making and consumption of professional arts and also calls attention to creative practice that's integrated into our everyday lives, making, doing, teaching, learning. This work has included our efforts to strengthen relationships and enhance our capacity to serve diverse constituencies and geographies. We've increased our connections to historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, minority serving institutions, and tribal colleges. This includes our recent travel to Alaska to connect with rural indigenous communities, meeting with educators at HBCUs and the HBCU Week Conference. It includes hiring the NEA's first chief diversity officer, as well as soon hiring our first ever director of native arts and tribal affairs. We also have built upon existing NEA initiatives, such as the Citizens Institute on Rural Design. Established in 1991, this leadership initiative brings design professionals, local leaders, and local residents together to enhance the quality of life in rural America through creative placemaking. We've nearly doubled our investment in the Citizens Institute on Rural Design. It's expanded to include more rural communities, deepened the technical assistance available for participants as well. We've also bolstered our work on the Mayor's Institute on City Design, a partnership between the NEA and the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Starting in 1986, MICD provides programming to help mayors with urban design issues of their cities in cities of all sizes. We're offering even more resources through MICD for mayors to understand the role of arts and culture in strengthening communities. This includes a suite of relevant case studies, research on arts and culture funding strategies, targeted technical support for program alumni, and integrating artists and leading arts and cultural experts on MICD resource teams. Recently, the NEA and regional arts organizations announced over $12 million in Arts Here grants to the first cohort of Arts Here organizations. This happened last month. Not only does this initiative represent funding to individual organizations with a strong track record in serving underserved populations, it was designed and brought to life through a partnership with all of the regional arts organizations, thus creating a shared aim across regions nationwide. Rooted in the Biden-Harris administration's commitment to equity and justice outlined in the president's 2021 executive order, Arts Here represents the NEA's most recent programmatic step to help ensure that all Americans can benefit from the arts. Recently, we had the opportunity to visit the new McCree Theater an Arts Here grantee in Flint, Michigan. During our visit, we learned how this funding will help increase their engagement with local seniors and expand their offerings to meet the specific needs of the people in Flint. In addition to receiving funding, this initiative leverages several strengths of the NEA as a connector, convener, and catalyst. Arts Here will also strengthen arts ecosystems as a learning initiative 
including opportunities for organizations to engage in peer-to-peer -peer learning. Arts Here will create opportunities for research to identify best practices, organizational needs, and areas for funders to better understand how to support arts ecosystems in underserved communities. In an effort to better recognize the individuals around the country who make opportunities for rich, diverse cultural experiences possible, I'm very happy to share with you that beginning in fiscal year 2026, we've increased honorific programs for National Heritage Fellows, Jazz Masters, and Creative Writing Fellows from $25,000 to $50,000. While we're known as a funder over the past few years, we've also emphasized our role as a national resource. Some notable work in this area includes expanding our longstanding research activities to deepen our understanding of the wide ranging impacts the arts have across fields of health and wellness, social connection, public safety, education, and more. This year, we convened approximately 50 researchers from NEA research labs and partners. This is the first in-person NEA research lab summit since 2019. The NEA Research Labs are a national program that enables transdisciplinary research teams to pursue research areas of interest uh, to the NEA and others. This summit provided opportunities to share the latest findings and networks to continue bolstering arts research capacity across the country. We're also working to ensure that current data is readily available through the NEA's National Arts Statistics and Evidence Reporting Center, or NACERC, and its Arts Indicator Series. By analyzing and reporting regularly on key metrics across NEA and other public data sources, this work has the potential to create value for the field and beyond, enriching our understanding about artist labor and career pathways, cultural assets in communities, education, and various kinds of arts participation. At the start of my career nearly three decades ago, the economic argument was the central argument for supporting the arts. While affirming the importance of economic impacts of the arts, presently, the NEA is also helping from our national perch to steward a paradigmatic shift in how we value the arts and artists in our society. The economic development argument is still important and valid, but it's only part of the story. Many of the conversations and collaborations between the arts and other fields taking place now would have been considered highly improbable a few decades ago. To help guide this work, we established the NEA's Office of Partnerships, Expansion, and Innovation. Over the last several years, we've witnessed a promising evolution in this area. As evident in the Healing, Bridging, Thriving Summit on the roles of arts and culture and communities that we convened with the White House Domestic Policy Council back in January, we now have a stronger capacity to work across the federal government as well as philanthropy to strengthen and launch critically important arts-based work. Examples include new initiatives with the Health and Human Services Department focused on the arts and healing, including an interagency working group on arts, health, and civic infrastructure, and efforts focused on combating so social isolation and addressing men mental health consistent with advisories from the Surgeon General. Strengthening our long collaboration with the Department of Education on arts education efforts and now celebrating new guidance on the availability of Title I funds for arts education in underserved communities. Expanding our work with the Departments of Defense and Veterans Affairs focused on helping to heal military personnel and military connected populations through clinical and very importantly, community-based components of NEA's Creative Forces Initiative. A collaboration with the Environmental Protection Agency focused on an artists in residence program, strengthened work with FEMA to ensure that the needs of artists and arts organizations are addressed in disasters, and also helping FEMA to recognize the roles of artists and arts organizations as part of prevention and recovery work. And there's more. 
We're also deepening investments in arts, health, and well-being through a $5 million pilot program to foster social connection and belonging through the arts. Among the grants before you for consideration are nine demonstration projects totaling $1.35 million. These projects address social connection, belonging, and mental health through arts-driven strategies from a range of artistic disciplines. They demonstrate an array of ways that artists and cultural organizations contribute to health initiatives. And many of the projects support communities in building resilience and healing from collective experiences of trauma. State arts agencies and agencies representing U.S. jurisdictions are also part of this work on arts, health, and well-being, with the vast majority of agencies accepting an invitation and resources to work in this realm. This portfolio of work will help pave the way for increased future adoption and promotion of arts and cultural programs and engagement by the health sector. Another area of influence is the NEA's ability to lead national conversations, amplify important ideas, and help them ripple out across the nation to all corners of our country. Although it's still early, we're seeing signs of this happening after the Healing Bridging Thriving Summit this past January. For example, during our last council meeting, leaders from the Ohio State Arts Council shared that there was an excitement in their state to continue conversations about integrating the arts in diverse areas of policy and practice. They viewed activities during our visit, including a town hall, as helping to carry that public conversation forward. As stewards of efforts to animate work at the intersection of the arts and other fields, the NEA is helping to lead national conversations on the arts as critical contributors to our health, social fabric, democracy, workforce, and more. In recent months, we participated in events such as Policy Link's Equity Summit and the United Nations General Assembly Healing Arts Week Symposium hosted by New York University, among others. Next month, I'll be participating in a local convening in Philadelphia to discuss similar themes of arts integration. By engaging in these conversations and lifting up exemplary work around the country, we're shifting norms about too often narrow interpretations of the roles of the arts in our society. Our commitment to helping the field imagine, plan, and build the next version of itself requires staff to have more proximity to practitioners and the communities we serve. With the intention of being relevant and strategic, we're evolving internally, becoming a learning and adaptive organization, engaging the field in ways that promote reflection, learning, and networking. All this, along with our observations about trends that we're able to see from our perch as a national entity, informs our work on helping to shape the future of the field. We're seeding and amplifying necessary conversations. For example, next week, we're with, P with the President's Committee on Arts and Humanities, holding a meeting on the future of theater. We're involved in conversations with a range of stakeholders exploring the challenges and opportunities associated with, our, with artificial intelligence. We're also involved in work on the future of disaster relief and prevention, among other topics. Additionally, we're providing resources for experimentation in new ways of working. We're reviewing our guidelines and making adjustments that are responsive to the field and informed by research. We're encouraging investments in leadership development and organizational capacity, as well as working with partners to expand opportunities for sustainable career pathways for artists. And through various modalities, we continue to, to track, report, and address important trends in the field. Tremendous progress in a few short years, progress that will help shape the next version of the arts and cultural sector and continue to make the arts more relevant to our society. To the dedicated staff of the National Endowment for the Arts, members of the National Council on the Arts, and the arts professionals and leaders working in communities across the country. Thank you. This work relies on all of us and these accomplishments would not be possible without you. 
As we continue to look ahead, we do so with an appreciation for the context we find ourselves in, the known power of the arts and the opportunities before us to continue to make sure that all people in our nation live artful lives. Just as President Biden has often called artists, truth tellers, bridge builders, and change seekers, he's also said that artists have made us a better America. We all must steward this work with renewed resolve and optimism for a better and more hopeful future through the arts. Thank you. Before we transition to the next portion of the program, I'm delighted to introduce a clip of a brief conversation produced by Instituto Cultural Puerto Riqueño, highlighting Miguel Zenon's work to produce free jazz concerts throughout Puerto Rico and create opportunities for underserved communities in Puerto Rico to enjoy jazz. Hello everyone, my name is Jessabe Vivas Capo and I am the programmatic advisor to the executive director of Instituto de Cultura Puerto Riqueña. I want to begin by greeting Dr. Maria Rosario Jackson, chair of the National Endowment for the Arts, as well as the National Endowment for the Arts Council, its staff and all who are tuning in. Today, I have the incredible opportunity to talk with the extraordinary Grammy winner, Doris Duke artist and Guggenheim and MacArthur fellow, Miguel Senon. Thank you so much, Miguel, for taking the time to be with us today. We know that you are touring through Latin America, and we really appreciate you making the time for this conversation. Of course, my pleasure to be here, and thank you for having me. In 2011, you founded Caravana Cultural, and since then, you have been presenting free of charge jazz concerts around Puerto Rico often in rural areas and aimed at underserved communities. This project also includes an, an educational component as well. Could you please talk to us about Caravana Cultural and what motivated you to develop this amazing initiative? Yeah, yeah. So like you mentioned, Caravana Cultural is a project that was established in, in 2011. Uh, you know, this had been a dream of mine for a very long time. Uh, the idea of using music to make uh, sort of like a cultural investment in Puerto Rico. I mean, and I, and I say music because it's what I have to offer. If I was doing something else, then I would I would be doing that. But I felt like what I had to offer was this, and I was thinking about ways of doing uh, using music to to make this investment to make connections with people sort of directly. You know, I think. Um, when I started, you know, I mentioned this this idea of starting music early and, and you know, connecting with teachers and starting at an early age. When, when I started studying music, it wasn't a job yet. You know, it wasn't my job. It was just I did it because I loved it and I still do it because I love it. But now it's my job. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to get back to this idea of of really using music as a way to connect with others. Uh, and, you know, specifically. I felt that this the, the idea for the project of making it free of charge, of course, uh, speaks to the idea of, uh, you know, cultural experiences are integral to society. That's obvious, and, and I think by this point, most of us understand that this is a, a reality. Uh, but I also feel that it's important uh, to sort of cement the fact that it should be available to everybody, you know. Uh, this this kind of thing should be it, it should be right there for the grabbing, uh, and it, it it doesn't always is. And you know when I go back to this, this idea of, of of music being a job and music being a career, you know sometimes you have to pay tickets, you have to move around, you have to travel. Uh, you know there are certain uh, obstacles sometimes you have to go through in order to actually be have access to to a cultural event, music or theater film those kinds of things so we wanted to make it a direct connection so you know you don't have to pay for a ticket and you don't have to go anywhere we'll come to your community so that's why we identify communities in puerto rico like you mentioned and the more rural areas of puerto rico that don't usually get these kinds of visits from the outside so they have a lot of cultural activity but it's local so they don't get a lot of things from the outside so we identify communities we'll bring this jazz concerts that talk about you know the history of jazz talk about 
historical jazz figures like Miles Davis or John Coltrane or Duke Ellington, uh, and also work uh, with local musicians, young musicians in the community, right? So we identify a local music teacher who can work with young students who then perform with us in the concert. We give them a little scholarship, a little grant to buy instruments at the end of the concert. And again, the idea is to use music as a way of preaching this message of, of you know, cultural accessibility, but also to, um, you know, cement just the message of all music is for everybody, you know, and I think it's, 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 is a common fact that when we think about jazz or we think about classical music or things like that, we think, well, you need to, you need to kind of have something before you need to sort of like a prerequisite. You need to like be informed or educated. And it's not really the case. And it's my, it's been my experience. I mean, we've done about 12 or 13 concerts since then. It's been my experience that, you know, everyone that attends these concerts enjoys the experience. And people come up to me after the fact, you know, older people, young kids, uh, you know, I've never been to a jazz concert before. This is the first time I ever experienced something like this. I loved it. I would love to know more about it, which is the greatest reward you could receive when you put in something like this, because it, it really tells you that there's a, there's a, there's a clear message when it's unadulterated, when it's just like clear from you to the audience, to the ear. It all, it's all, if, and if it's delivered correctly and, and, you know, in the right manner, it's always effective. You always connect. And you always engage with an audience. So that's basically what the project is. Uh, we're hoping to keep it going. You know, it's a lot of work. It's self-produced. I mean, I do all this myself with help with some friends in Puerto Rico. Uh, we hope, hoping to keep it going, but it's without, you know, without discussion, uh, or, or any kind of hesitance in my side, it's definitely been the most rewarding thing that music has, music has given me because beyond, you know, recognitions and any kind of thing, any achievements, the fact that you can actually use music to connect with people from where I'm from and just kind of get back that way, uh, is, is no, there's no comparison. Miguel, it has been such an honor to have this conversation with you and, and to witness and, and get to know more about your commitment and belief in the transformative power of music and arts education for, for youth and for society in general. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us and best of luck in the rest of your tour. And, and thank you again to our audience, especially our colleagues from the National Endowment for the Arts. Thank you. Of course, it's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jezabeth, and thank you, Miguel. The NEA has sought to respond quickly and effectively to the COVID-19 pandemic and provided additional funds through the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan to support the field. With these funds, we made an unprecedented investment of $20.2 million to 66 local arts agencies across the country. These funds were made available for subgranting to assist arts organizations and artists save jobs in the sector, and keep arts organizations' doors open. The, N the NEA has embedded a culture of learning at our agency and has gleaned lasting lessons from coordinating relief funds from the CARES Act and American Rescue Plan. These lessons continue to shape how we're showing up as an agency and the direction we're taking to create synergies and work strategically with regional, state, and local arts agencies. Notably, over the past three fiscal years, we've seen a steady rise in applications for grants from local arts agencies. To meet this growing need, the NEA allocated $4.6 million for local arts agencies in fiscal year 24, a 270% increase over fiscal year 21 levels. In addition to these funding increases to local arts agencies, we're currently conducting a two-year study in partnership with 2M Research to better understand how the NEA can support local arts agencies at their best. To share more about this work, please join me in welcoming the NEA's Director of State, Regional, and Local Partnerships and International Activities, Michael Orlov, and Civic Partnerships Manager, Eleanor Billington. Mike and Eleanor, welcome. 
Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And hello to all of our colleagues in the field. Sending uh, warm greetings from Puerto Rico, where many of us are in attendance for the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies. My name is Michael Orlov. I'm a middle-aged white male wearing a uh, polka dot shirt sitting in a hotel room in a very sunny and hot and humid San Juan, Puerto Rico. Uh, we're really excited to have our national council meeting focused on local arts agencies today. Uh, Maria uh, shared a number of highlights within the local arts agency portfolio. Our extraordinary investment to local arts agencies through the American Rescue Plan back in 2021. She underscored our increasing investment to both project grants and subgranting activity. And uh, of course, our first ever research initiative focused on the local arts agency field. And we are super excited to announce sometime in November, a cooperator for a new capacity building and networking initiative tentatively, tentatively titled the Local Arts Agency National Cohort Program. While I know many tuning in may in fact be local arts agencies, hello out there, everybody, uh, we thought it might be a good idea to quickly establish some basic definitions. So what is a local arts agency? And I We'll turn the mic over to Eleanor Billington, our Civic Partnerships Manager, who will give a brief overview. Hello, Eleanor. Thank you, Michael. Hello. I hope everything is going well down in Puerto Rico. I am a middle-aged white woman with long brown hair. I'm wearing brown glasses and a blue sweatshirt sweater. Uh, it's a little colder here in D.C. than Puerto Rico, Michael, but I um, am happy to say it's sunny uh, in the district as well. There are many ways to define and describe local arts agencies or LAAs, but I'm gonna start with the definition in the NEA's enabling legislation, which states, the term local arts agency means a community organization or an agency of local government that primarily provides financial support, services, or other programs for a variety of artists and arts organizations for the benefit of the community as a whole. In the NEA's grant application guidelines, we expand on this definition a bit more, and we primarily describe local arts agencies by what services they provide and how they might be structured. LAAs may be a department of local government, a nonprofit organization, or a public-private partnership. They may present or produce arts programming, maintain a cultural facility, commission and manage public art, they often administer grant programs and provide technical assistance to artists and arts organizations, and they often guide cultural and disaster planning efforts. LAAs are actively engaged in community development through cross-sector partnerships. They're often working with entities in tourism, housing, transportation, public education, and other social services. It's important to recognize that the field may not refer to their organization as a local arts agency. That term means something very, very different depending on what part of the country you're in. Some local arts agencies use the following language. Arts service organization, intermediary, cultural alliance, regional arts umbrella organization, and or a coalition of arts organizations. Regardless of the terminology, local arts agencies are a critical component to a healthy and vibrant arts ecosystem, and in turn, a healthy, connected community. Before I hand it back over to Michael, I do wanna mention that during the discussion, you will hear a lot of references to the acronym LAAs. We cannot seem to avoid those here in DC, but please just know that LAAs or locals refers to local arts agencies. Michael, back to you. Thanks, Eleanor. Uh, there's so much more to say here as local arts agencies, LAAs play such a pivotal leadership role in advocating for and advancing arts policy and funding at the local level. LAAs are uh, also a key component in the vertical axis of the NEA investment as they partner with state and regional arts agencies to strengthen the arts and culture sector at the local level. Local arts agencies also have a strong focus on community-facing work with a notable speed and nimbleness that allow local arts agencies to innovate, 
recalibrate and invest in local priorities through arts programming. And LAAs have the ability to subgrant federal dollars as an equitable way to redistribute NEA funds, which is really important to underscore. But you didn't hear, uh, you didn't tune in to hear me talk. Uh, we have an incredible panel to dig even deeper on this topic. As our chair referenced, the NEA has undertaken a major research in initiative to better understand, document, and strengthen the local arts agency field. We should give credit where credit is due. First off, to our chair for supporting this work and especially our colleagues at the Office of Research and Analysis, including Sunil Iyengar, Patricia Mullaney Loss, and a huge thanks to Catherine Zickier for taking this mammoth of a project on. Uh, go team, thank you so much. We were honored to be able to present this panel at Grantmakers in the Arts just a few short weeks ago in Chicago and uh, take a look at the cool uh, graphic representation of the session produced by Urban Wild Studio and artist Kinsey Fox. It's a nice little keepsake for from our GIA session. And delighted that the same group you see pictured from the GIA panel uh, is able to join us today. So allow me to briefly introduce our panelists. Please give a emoji-filled uh, welcome to Sally Dix, uh, the Executive Director of Bravo Greater Des Moines, Tracy Knuckles, Practice Lead Arts and Culture at Bloomberg and Associate, Bloomberg Associates, Patricia Mullaney Loss, our colleague who is a social science analyst at the National Endowment for the Arts in the Office of Research and Analysis, and Dennis Ochere, Economic Research Analyst at 2M Research. This panel will be moderated by Randy Ingstrom, former director of the Office of Arts and Culture of Seattle and current executive director of Third Way Creative. If you have questions, feel free to jot them down in the Q&A box and we're gonna do our best to get to as many of them as time allows. Uh, to the panel, we really appreciate you all um, being with us um, and we also appreciate everybody online being with us today i'm sending it over now to our excellent moderator who is zooming in from seattle so a very early wake-up call uh this morning for randy uh, i hand it over to you thanks michael uh never too early for the arts uh, my name is randy engstrom as michael said uh, i am a solidly middle-aged uh, white male with uh, increasingly salt in my peppered uh, hair and beard. I have uh, glasses and a patterned blue shirt, and I'm really grateful to be with you today. Um, it is a really fascinating time in, in the public sector generally and in the, the, the local arts agency ecosystem specifically as we uh, emerge from a pandemic that has left a pretty long tail. So I think that the research that the NEA is doing is really well-timed and we're really grateful that this is happening. And um, I should also say thank you to Grantmakers in the Arts for hosting this session, which was kind of the impetus for us to organize it. And shout out to um, President and CEO Eddie Torres. I see you in the chat. And it was uh, it was really great to see the interest that this session generated at the conference. It was uh, standing room only in the room. And so I think that speaks to the um, sort of interest and urgency in the conversation around how we navigate many of the issues we heard the chair describe. Um, we've seen a lag in the return of audiences with a, with a correlating rise in costs. We've seen a massive number of transitions in leadership across the field. Uh, we're wrestling with issues like AI and uh, increased polarization in our country. And in addition, um, you know, this the the while the um, rescue plan and and the COVID relief efforts were so critical to our field, we're now seeing this cliff where all that money is run out, and it's unclear how uh, our field is going to find its economic footing. Um, we're wrestling with issues of equity uh, and the attendant backlash to equity. We're we're really seeking networks of care and networks of practice across the field. Um, so it's it's really timely that the NEA is engaging in this research 
uh, because we really need a sense of both where we are, what we need, and where we need to go. And something that's that I really appreciate about the this project that the NEA has undertaken is that they're sort of bringing us behind the curtain. I think the phrase we used at the conference was we're like in in between the the first and second period. We have like two more periods to go. We have uh, to borrow a hockey reference. I don't know if that's lost in this crowd or not, but I digress. Um, we're 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 midstream in this work, and so there's still time to shape and to and to affect where this where this goes, and. Um, uh, yeah, just grateful that we have this time, grateful that Danny is doing this work and really curious uh, to hear what folks want to know from this audience. We got great feedback from the session uh, in Chicago, and we really hope to get some of that set, that uh, feedback from you all here today. With that, I am going to um, turn the first question, kind of the grounding question to my new friend, Patricia from the NEA to sort of share what we've learned from this research project to date. What do we know so far and where do we think this is going? Patricia. Thank you so much, Randy. Really happy to be here today. I'm a white woman with what can only be described as salt and pepper hair as well, wearing a black top with some white uh, piping and accents. Uh, I'm really happy to be talking about our study on local arts agencies. To date, the NEA has never conducted a nationwide study on locals. You will hear me likely refer to them as LAAs or locals throughout this short presentation. Next slide. This study will help the NEA and the field at large understand the landscape and needs of LAAs. The findings will better strengthen the NEA's capacity to serve LAAs beyond grant making. We hope the study will identify opportunities for the agency and other funders to help increase the viability of LAAs, connect those that might otherwise operate in isolation, provide key information about LAAs and factors in promoting their long-term sustainability, lay the groundwork for better communications and learning across the LAA field, and improve our own internal NEA documentation process for LAA applicants and grantees. As Randy mentioned, we are currently in the middle of phase one of a two-phase study, so about a third of the way through this entire project. We so far, um, next slide, sorry, we so far have completed uh, the following activities. We've convened a technical working group of LAA national leaders. Um, we are very happy that Tracy is, is on that technical working group. We have conducted a literature review, created a mapping analysis, and hosted listening sessions with LAAs across the country. We are currently working on a typology analysis, and then we'll turn our attention to developing research questions and a research plan for phase two. We are also looking to create and maintain a data set of LAAs. So now let's get into some interim findings. Using data we currently have based on NEA applicant, as well as state arts agency and regional arts organization grantee records, we've been able to map known LAAs across the US. We've then overlaid counties onto these maps and identified areas that are potentially underserved by LAAs. While 76% of counties have LAAs, that means around 24% of counties across the US are potentially underserved by LAAs. And here we're defining underserved as no or fewer than one LAA per 50,000 people. We've used demographic data by county to look at characteristics of these potential service areas. And we've noted that counties that are potentially underserved by known LAAs often exhibit higher proportions of people of color and renter occupied households compared to national averages. So let me show you one sample map from our analysis showing the density of LAAs. The darker the orange, the higher number or concentration of LAAs that you can see uh, throughout the, the country. The map shows that known LAAs are highly concentrated in the Eastern US and with, with major metropolitan areas, which not surprisingly is consistent with population distributions in this country. This map, however, does not tell us some other important things to consider such as organization size, service area, 
constituencies directly benefiting from LA programs and, and a lot of other variables that we might think of as important. We're currently working to identify these data gaps and will incorporate findings into phase two of the study. So next, let's go to listening sessions. Researchers convened 32 LAAs representing 18 states in Puerto Rico for a series of listening sessions. Participants represented LAAs within local government and those with nonprofit status. And here I'll just share some themes that we identified from these conversations. And these really mirror some of what Randy was talking about in his introduction. So I'm uh, it's been interesting to see that what we've maybe heard anecdotally has been confirmed again through uh, some of this research. First theme is identity and cohesion. Not uh, LAAs do not necessarily call themselves local arts agencies. They think of themselves as grant making organizations, cultural leaders and advocates, and increasingly organizations that directly support local artists. There is a need for fieldwide convenings and conversations so that organizations with these shared identities can connect with each other. Next, we have service and partnerships. LAAs partner with a variety of institutions like state and regional cultural agencies, local arts institutions, businesses, community foundations, and educational institutions, all in service of furthering their work and expanding access to the arts for their constituents. LA is embedded within local government have unique opportunities to work with other governments to do just that. Many identify that as both a need and a challenge um, to serve rural communities. Then COVID challenges absolutely came up during these conversations. Uh, the pandemic has accelerated leadership transitions and I believe Dennis will talk more about this uh, during his portion of the session. Um, People have noted, as Randy also has, that pandemic recovery funds are now drying up, which leads to funding concerns. Private funding from individuals and corporations has seemed to decrease in recent years amidst rising costs. And lastly, LAAs are developing strategies to promote equity within organizational structures, outreach, and programming. So this is just a start, and there's a lot more to do in phase one, and then we'll move on to phase two. So phase two of the study will be a mixed method study, meaning we will use both quantitative and qualitative research methods. This could be focus groups, interviews, listening sessions, a survey. We don't exactly know what the study will look like yet, but we do have some very important goals. We want to investigate the central role LAs play in local arts ecosystems and local civic interest infrastructure. Um, we will then focus on better understanding LAA structures, their programs and services, how they do cross-sector work and create partnerships, as well as needs, barriers, and opportunities. Findings will inform the NEA's future engagement with LAAs through technical assistance and field convenings. So lastly, I'll just share uh, in the next slide that during phase two, we will seek out diverse perspectives from LAAs, and there will absolutely be further opportunities for input. If you currently have questions or comments about this research, please feel free to e email locals at arts.gov. And with that, I, I will turn it back over to Randy, I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Patricia. Um, and I'm, I'm already seeing in the chat questions about how to participate. There will be ways to participate, and we are glad to share this information with all of you. Um, the next question goes to Dennis, our, our, our researcher in chief here on the panel, which is what findings about the local arts agency ecosystem surprised you as you engaged in this work? Thank you uh, very much, Randy, and uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I am a black male with short black hair, uh, wearing a pink dress shirt with a blue striped tie and uh, a rectangular glass. I appreciate the NEA and uh, the National Council on the Art for the opportunity to share uh, findings from phase one of the study. Uh, Patricia has uh, provided 
some of the interim findings, and so I'll try not to uh, repeat uh, those. Uh, but to guide my discussion, I would like to first of all point out that it will be based largely on the listening sessions that we conducted with the 32 uh, LAAs and also based on some of the preliminary typology analysis uh, findings that we've had so far. Uh, it will also be guided by one key insight, uh, which is how truly varied and complex the LAA landscape is, especially in how different agencies operate, uh, the post-COVID challenges that Patricia and Randy uh, mentioned, and how uh, LAA's funding structures are shaping up their responses to a uh, crisis like the pandemic. So one of the key findings from the listening sessions was the severe impact that the pandemic has had on all LAAs, but particularly on smaller LAAs. The so smaller LAAs often operate with limited staff and resources. And the post-COVID recovery has been particularly challenging for them due to staff shortages, uh, budget cuts, and generally uncertainty. Uh, related to the post-COVID struggles, several LAAs in the listening sessions also discussed how the pandemic led to considerable staff turnover across LAAs, again, especially among small organizations and at the leadership levels. Uh, this turnover has led to substantial loss of institutional knowledge, which has further complicated the post-COVID recovery process for many of these LAAs. And as one participant in the listening session put it, there was a major turnover and a lot of past history was lost, unquote. The next finding that I would like to point out uh, it based, is based on how, and this is from our preliminary typology analysis, is based on how LAAs vary significantly in terms of their size and available resources. Uh, budget size was possibly the, the starkest area of difference across LAAs. Uh, ranging from less than $100,000 for small LAAs to budget in excess of $10 million for uh, large LAAs based on the, the data set that we used, which is based on known LAAs. Uh, we also discovered that funding sources, whether public, private, or a combination of them, uh, has significantly been impacted, not only what LAAs can do, but also how they respond to, to crisis. So for example, LAAs that primarily uh, rely on public funding, such as municipal budgets, faced severe financial constraints during the pandemic, which limited the ability to you know, pivot quickly to virtual programming. Uh, similarly, LAAs that operate performance venues and rely significantly on ticket sales as a revenue source were also deeply affected by the pandemic. And so with reduced audience numbers and slower recovery of live event attendance, you know, these LAAs face critical financial hurdles. As Patricia pointed out from the equity mapping analysis, there is an uneven distribution of known LAAs across uh, the US communities, particularly in relation to population density, which highlight a potential equity gap. However, what we've learned from the listening sessions is that uh, many LAAs have evolved their practices to be more inclusive and equitable. Uh, these approaches vary. For instance, some legacy organizations have diversified their leadership and funding practices, while others are thinking, are rethinking the competitive grant application processes to reduce barriers for first-time applicants and underserved uh, in underserved communities. Finally, uh, one of the clearest takeaways from this study 
it's that LAAs and small smaller LAAs in particular need more tailored support to navigate post-COVID recovery. Uh, this includes not just funding, uh, but also capacity building efforts, uh, such as leadership development, technology training, and peer-to-peer -peer networks where small or all LAAs can learn from one another. Uh, many of the LAAs that participated in the listening sessions advocated for the use of a central hub or a community of practice uh, to facilitate knowledge sharing to harness uh, best practices. These findings have implications on how the NEA can serve the field in the future. Despite you know, the insights that we've gained so far, gaps still remain uh, based on the study, especially in understanding the full extent of LAA service areas, their diverse roles and impact, and the specific needs of underserved and rural communities, among several other limitations. And uh, these findings will serve as the foundation for developing the research questions, which will also inform the next phase of the study. Uh, thank you for your attention. I look forward to your thoughts and continued discussions, and I will turn it back to Randy. Thank you so much, Dennis. Um, and some great questions coming in in the chat. We appreciate that. We'll get to those after we hear from our panelists. Our next uh, question goes to Tracy Knuckles. Um, Tracy, you uh, were, have worked in a local. You also work in private philanthropy, and you were uh, an advisor uh, to this project. What can you tell us about that perspective? Like, what do you see as the role for private philanthropy? And what did you take away from your role as an advisor? Thanks, Randy. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm joining you from New York City. And I am an African-American woman with curly hair, wearing a black jacket and round gold earrings. Um, the technical working group um, is uh, advising and listening in on uh, the research and riding along and trying to be helpful. But my experience so far really has affirmed what I've known for a long time about LAAs. And that is that they are a central infrastructure for funding arts and culture. And that in order to effectively reach communities and deliver access to arts, you absolutely need them. Um, I think there's no better evidence of that than what has been borne out in the research uh, behind the federal relief funds for the arts coming out of COVID. Uh, Bloomberg has supported uh, some research done by SMU Data Arts, uh, understanding the breadth and reach of that funding, which all told was $53 billion for both nonprofit and commercial arts and culture. And just yesterday, SMU released a follow-up to that report that did a deeper dive uh, looking at 11 uh, metropolitan areas with local arts agencies that were responsible for the administration of roughly $100 million. You know, having worked at one for 10 years in New York City, I was already a believer, but that research in particular um, showed a few things. One is that LAAs are really effective advocating for arts and culture in a way that is multi-layered, cross-disciplinary. They are talking to artists, they are talking to grassroots organizations, uh, community workers and community organizers. That advocacy is intergovernmental. They're talking to deputy mayors for health and human services and homelessness commissioners and economic development professionals. They're getting a seat at the table where most important uh, for arts and culture to be part of the conversation. Second, uh, that research showed that where possible, LAAs have moved federal funding efficiently. $100 million is a lot of money to come to the arts at one time. And while it's not always easy to move federal money, where possible, local arts agencies were simplifying applications, limiting or waiving reporting requirements for grantees whose work and creative practice were well known. And that really is trust-based philanthropy at work, which is what private philanthropy has been talking about uh, in recent years. And finally, local arts agencies were really trying to put equity first in moving federal arts relief money. And you know they were ensuring that that money was going to communities with a history of disinvestment or limited access to arts. 
and those that were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. So I'm excited to see what phase two will bring and uh, hope I can continue to be helpful as part of the working group. Thank you, Tracy. I think you're always helpful. And I'm, <laughs> I'm grateful that you uh, are an advisor on this project. Um, the endowment's lucky to have you and we are as well. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to turn to our closer, Miss Sally Dix. Um, Sally, you, you wear a couple of different hats here as the, he the actual head of a local arts agency, a practitioner here on this panel. And you also are a co-chair of the Urban Arts Coalition, which is a constellation of local arts agencies that represent large metro regions. So from that perspective, um, how can the findings of this research advance the needs of practitioners such as yourself? And what research questions or lines of inquiry are the most important or actionable from your perspective? Good morning. Thanks, Randy. And thanks everyone for the chance to be here. And um, it's so exciting to have full conversations about local arts agencies, which is something most of us don't get to do in our communities very often. So uh, I'm really grateful for the chance to be here. I am a white female with shoulder length brown hair. I have on glasses and a black jacket today. Um, so as Randy said, I'm wearing two hands, hats today, both as a local practitioner and as a colleague to many other local practitioners. And it's an interesting question, right? Because what do LAAs need? Well, we've just had five panelists tell us that we don't even really fully understand what an LAA is. So it's difficult to represent and address that. Um, but a couple of things we do know. We do know that LAAs are where policy becomes reality. And we do know that LAAs are critical partners in advancing culture and community. Uh, so yes, there is variability in the field. There are important and essential distinctions, especially between those nonprofit LAAs and those that operate as part of a local government or some, you know, some hybrid. So I think that operating model is going to be really, really interesting. I also think it's critical to remember that LAAs are inherently, by their nature, it's right there in the name, local. They are products and partners of the communities that they serve, and they exist to meet unique, on-the-ground, local priorities. So each community and region is going to have specific requirements. So, Randy, to the question, I think one of the key outcomes will have to be understanding the scale and scope of the field, uh, not only to enhance the work that local arts agencies are doing, but also making sure that they are seen and visible and valued, um, no longer considered separate from the essential work in a community, but actually really deeply integral to what is trying to be achieved in every municipality. Um, I think in this moment, and a lot of this has also been acknowledged, there's a really dynamic tension for a lot of local arts agencies, not just in the funding models or the structures, but also in the challenges we're facing in our communities. Um, many local arts agencies really want to focus on the big visions, the housing and hunger and universal basic income, and how can we make sure that arts are at those tables? But we're also facing really challenging immediate decisions about unemployment in the sector and organizations closing and merging and questions about the value of the work that we do and the sector that we support. Uh, lots of, in my community, lots of talk right now about the value of tourism and outsiders coming in and the role that sports is particularly playing in that. Um, but here at, at Bravo, we really wanna focus also on the values of our home community and the people who live here and want to see themselves represented and, and presented in the arts programming that's happening. And then uh, I don't think I'm saying something that's news to anyone, but there is sometimes distance between public officials and the actual public. So making sure that we're bridging that gap, I think another outcome then of, of this work will be to create that connection um, that foundation for connection across all of our local arts agencies. How can we better connect the work that's already being done and potentially start to address some of those gaps and better create those networks of care and support and learning? Uh, I think part of that has to come from, from, from vertical infrastructure, what this potentially sets up 
federal, regional, state, local, some sort of hierarchy with a collective agenda so that we're truly all working together, able to impact our local communities, but also reflecting shared agendas across boundaries, across policy areas, and making sure that we're aligning policy with practice again. So some of the areas of inquiry that I think are going to be the most important uh, based just on my perspective and conversations with other brilliant colleagues in the field. Um, I think it's essential that the NEA goes beyond mapping uh, and digs into promising practices and ways to better connect services with communities. I think also um, making sure that in this moment at these early stages that we're keeping our eye on a sustainable system of current data collection and distribution. This can't just be a snapshot and a moment in time. It has to track that turnover that we've been talking about and make sure that it's welcoming in some of the new and emerging leaders that have um, that have new and different perspectives but may not have access to the networks and the content. I think, again, uh, being responsive to those areas of similarity and uniquely responding to areas of difference, a one size fits all model would be uh, would be ineffective and um, maybe that will involve creating, you know, affinity spaces or subsections in addition to this broader definition of LAAs, what are some of the, the niche areas within that that we can work with. And then um, this is another thing that I, I hope we can all move towards is um, leveraging this information and data to make sure that we are approaching this work with an abundance mindset. I know there is um, always a scarcity of resources. That is the reality. But if there's a way that we can leverage what we do have and the collaboration and the networks and the visibility that will hopefully come out of this work, uh, I think that will make a huge difference. Finally, I just think the number one thing uh, that I would say is, is critically important, and, and the NEA has acknowledged this many, many times in this conversation and along this path, but local arts agencies absolutely have to be included in the process at every step of the way, making sure that the people closest to the work on the ground are represented as it is iterated and evolved. Thank you so much, Sally. I really appreciate um, calling out the abundance uh, mindset. I, I mean, we are in this together. This is collectively a very challenging moment and uh, we're all we got. And so we've got to figure out ways to bridge the urban and rural, the coastal to the to the interior, the north to the south. Um, we have to, you know, and I appreciate that the NEA has taken a very thoughtful and nuanced approach to how they're trying to meet different communities where they are. And I think that's maybe the first question I will turn. Uh, Patricia, I might uh, throw this to you. There's been a number of questions in the chat around um, wh what's the correlation of, of all of the density of local arts agencies in the Northeast and how are we dealing with overlapping constituencies, city and county? Um, and, you know, how are how are you accounting for, you know, the unique needs of those smaller rural communities, those white spots on the map um, that you that you displayed earlier? Um, so how are how are you and the and the endowment thinking about engaging that that nuance? These are all really, really important questions. And I will just say that we are currently working through a lot of them. Uh, we are in the process now of identifying gaps in our data and also reckoning with what we have available. So for instance, to um, one question's point about a correlation between um, how states classify LAAs and different states classify LAAs in different ways or don't. And so that might lead to showing more LAAs on the map or fewer LAAs. And um, that is just the reality of what we currently have within our data set. Again, we are working through um, uh, a, a set of criteria for inclusion and exclusion and really taking a more expansive approach to uh, entities that we consider an LAA in this current process. Um, and we hope to, uh, towards the end of this project, come up with a, a working national list of LAAs. Uh, TBD, whether we can make that public depending on the, um, the quality of the data that, that we're able to capture. But Within that data set, we also hope to capture service area uh, to the point of whether they um, service areas overlap or not. We'd want to have those variables within our data set so that we can better understand um, the, the total composition of, of LAAs across the country. So 
Um, and that would include perhaps some LAAs that are located in, in a slightly more metropolitan area, but are really dedicated to serving rural areas or rural organizations that, of course, are dedicated to serving their own communities as well. So I would just say there is a lot more to come. And we, again, are only a, a third of the way through this process. We also, um, to I think some other questions in, in the chat, are, are really hoping to cross-check our own list with uh, lists other organizations have compiled or, or other states have compiled. So that will be part of the process as well. Thank you so much, Patricia. Um, wanted to take a beat here and just see if any of the council members have questions for the panel. Uh, no pressure, but since this is your meeting, wanted to, to offer a little bit of space for, for you all to weigh in if there's anything that uh, stands out to you from this conversation. Chair Jackson, this is um, Council Member Becker. I, I do have a question if I can jump in. So um, this administration is very much focused on whole of government approach. And I live in a super rural community. So I, I just also want to just share that we've, even outside of the arts, I think there's so many commonalities on what rural communities are facing. So my question is, have you been able to feel the whole of government approach? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, thank you. So I'll just uh, comment, Bitta, and thank you for your question. And then I'll, I'll uh, extend your question to the panelists. Uh, one of the things that we've tried to do as we've strengthened relationships with state arts agencies, regional arts agencies, and local arts agencies is try to create the um, resources and uh, inclination to have that whole of government approach. Certainly, you know, what is happening at the national level um, with these relationships with other uh, federal agencies is most impactful when that is also mirrored at other geographic levels. So at you know the state and and at the local levels in particular. Um, so we we have done things to ensure that um, that sensibility is something that is known and present. Um, I'll turn it to the panel to respond specifically about what they're finding with regard to local arts agencies. Um, I do know that in rural communities, often, um, you know, people wear many hats, leaders wear many hats, and sometimes the integration of the arts appears in ways that are uh, far less siloed and more sophisticated than in other places. So I just want to register that personal observation. I don't know how that bears out in terms of how um, the research is, is being um, carried out and what people are learning. So I'll turn it back to, to the panel, but thank you for the question, Vita. Thanks so much, uh, Chair Jackson. I, I do, you know, we heard a theme through all of the panelists around this emergence of cross-sector practice, the ways in which particularly during the pandemic, arts and culture was looked to as a way to advance uh, health needs, to foster belonging, to, to help communities heal from this remarkable civic trauma that we've all lived through. So while it was a, a massive uh, tragedy and a, and a very traumatic event, it was also a, a moment where, where the arts and the role of artists and culture bearers in our community was really exceptional. And to that whole of government approach, I just want to lift up one thing that I, I think is really exciting from the endowment, the partnership with the Envir Environmental Protection Agency, fostering six artists and residents around uh, different watersheds throughout the country. I'm privileged to be working on the one here in the Green Duwamish watershed in the in the in the state of Washington. That that kind of partnership. Uh, I think brings the the creativity and the inspiration of artists into uh, cross departmental cross agency work. Um, Sally, Tracy, um, thinking about you in particular, what are some of those promising whole of government um, sort of practices and programs that you've seen emerging? I don't know, Sally, if you want to start, but. Um... You know, I, you mentioned an artist in residence program, and and those are among my favorite. Um, many local arts agencies have found approaches that bring the creative practice 
the community-based work of artists that has been happening for decades to government. Um, you know, one of one that comes to mind is, you know, the health workers pilot that happened in Chicago out of the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, which was groundbreaking work also done with federal relief funds, uh, not just from the NEA, but from um, other parts of government. So advocacy by D case, bringing money that doesn't that just wasn't art specific, but could have gone to any number of pressing needs coming out of COVID, but finding a way to integrate cross-sector practice and bringing the strengths that artists um, are well known to have um, to really meaningful engagement in places that uh, so, so needed it. You know, it's both workforce development, it's creative practice, it's multidisciplinary, um, and, you know, it's a natural fit for those that um, call arts uh, their core work. Thanks, Tracy. Sally? Yeah, I, I just it's funny, Randy. I wrote down the exact same words, creativity and innovation and inspiration. Um, that, of course, has been happening. If there's a silver lining to the pandemic, it's that that some of those federal relief dollars accelerated at the local level, some of those conversations and some of those cross sector partnerships, because no one could could do it alone. Um, so it was an opportunity to amplify in a lot of cases work that was already happening, um, but just just create more direct connections. Um, one of the things that we've seen on the ground here and Bravo is uh, unique in that we are actually a regional arts council. So we are both a local and a, a regional, but we've seen an explosion in the communities that we serve of municipal arts councils, which has been really interesting too. So under the Bravo service area, individual communities are now setting up within their city government arts councils, whether they're volunteers or appointed, um, really recognizing the role of arts and culture and really integrating it into policy making at the local level too. So I think there's been some really exciting progress and um, particularly in our community youth connections, uh, mental health and education and access to programming that has been really, really exciting on the ground and embodies that uh, that concept of connection and working together. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Um, last question for Patricia and Dennis. Uh, how can folks stay engaged in this work? Where can they go to find this information and how can people participate in the next uh, two thirds of this project going forward? Absolutely. We will be asking for more participation and input uh, as we move into phase two that the, the way and, and the timing of that input remains to be seen. Um, we are still working on developing a full set of research questions and a research plan for phase two, and that plan will dictate how we're seeking input from folks. Again, if you have any current questions or uh, want to share any additional feedback beyond this webinar, uh, please email locals at arts.gov because it, we want to remain in contact, but we will have more formal mechanisms of feedback uh, forthcoming uh, within uh, likely 2025. Uh, immigrant uh, communities like rural communities uh, often are isolated, uh, not only from the national level, but at the local level, their artists, their creations really don't get uh, much play. And uh, so has that been part of the research and uh, what kind of uh, suggestions have come up uh, as a part of the larger discussion? Patricia or Dennis? Yeah, I, I was going to turn this over to Dennis. I know that, again, we are a third of the way through this process, so we haven't had a lot of time to get into these deep topic areas that are, of course, very important. Um, Dennis, I'm not sure if anything came up in the listening sessions about that. Yeah, thank you. you you're right about the fact that we haven't done, you know, a deeper dive into these discussions, uh, but we have seen uh, a need and a desire of, you know, smaller LAAs and those in rural areas for opportunities, you know, to, you know, as we talk about a community of practice uh, where, 
uh, they will have the opportunity to see what others are doing. And also uh, many or some of them had raised an issue about a leadership gap. Uh, and the gap here means that, you know, they, they don't see who to who to fall onto or who to go to. And I believe that is where the NEA really comes in with this with this particular project. Uh, as we develop the research questions, these are some of the things that you know we are considering, and then hopefully, or potentially, uh, the next phase of the study will be able to look more into some of these uh, you know differences. I think we could have a full day conversation about this. And we probably will. Tracy, I know there was one more thing you wanted to add, and then I need to hand it back to the chair because we are at time. But please uh, feel free to share a final thoughts. I just wanted to answer the second half of the question you posed earlier, which was what philanthropy can do for local arts agency. And I would say first, listening and engagement. I will double down on what Sally said about local context and LEAs really knowing where it's at. If you want to understand the impact of your philanthropy dollars, if you want them to reach artists, if you want them to reach social justice causes, you should be talking to your local arts agency about where they can be most impactful. If you can fund a local arts agency as a philanthropy, you can and you should. Again, if it's not part of your strategy or your own internal regulations don't permit it, what kind of other partnerships can be built to help local arts agencies? You can introduce your local arts agency leader to other people in philanthropy. You can offer the meeting space. There's lots of support that goes a long way for LAAs that isn't just funding. So thank get you, to Tracy. It. We are in this together uh, and in the spirit of togetherness. Uh, thank you so much for the time and for the opportunity to share uh, this important work. And uh, I would love to hand it back to Chair Jackson, who for what it's worth, I think has been one of the most impactful chairs of the endowment for my entire life. So thank you for your work these last four years, Chair Jackson. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. That's very generous of you. And thank you to all our participants and council for your thoughtful contributions today. That was a terrific panel. Really appreciate all of you. Um, thank you to the public for your questions and your, your participation. We have a, a high number of participants uh, in, in audience today. And it's really wonderful to see. So thank you all. Before we report the results of the council votes, we have a final video clip to share from William Miranda Torres, mayor of Caguas, Puerto Rico. I've had the chance to travel throughout different towns in Puerto Rico, including Bayamón and Caguas, among others. And it's amazing to see the prominent role that the arts and culture play in shaping daily life in Puerto Rico. And it was wonderful to hear from Mayor Torres on how impactful the arts are in shaping Caguas. Hello and greetings to the National Endowment for the Arts Chair, Dr. Maria Rosario Jackson, to the National Endowment for the Arts Council, the staff at the National Endowment for the Arts, and all of those who are tuning in. My name is William E. Miranda Torres, the mayor of the Autonomous Municipality of Caguas, Puerto Rico, where I'll probably serve my fourth term. Founded in 1775 and nestled in the Caguas Valley at the eastern end of the Central Mountain Range, our city is home to approximately 128,000 residents as recorded in the 2020 census and consists of 11 wards mostly rural. Arts and culture are indispensable for the development of any society as they define who we are as a nation. They foster community engagement, instill sense of belonging and pride, create spaces for dialogue and participation, and ultimately enhance the quality of life for our citizens. Moreover, they stimulate economic growth and contribute to job creation. In alignment with strategic city plan, my administration has adopted guideline number five, Kawases Orgullo Criollo. This initiative emphasizes that our cultural identity, traditional knowledge, history, and heritage are foundational resources for sustainable development. Our aims include preserving cultural traditions, promoting heritage values as a catalyst for knowledge, cultivating social awareness, and reducing inequalities and celebrating cultural diversity to encourage harmonious coexistence. 
The municipal government of Caguas operates under a strong cultural framework supported by various ordinances. These established policies and guidelines to ensure the effective implementation and continuity of our cultural programs as well as the protection of our heritage. Key to this mission is the Department of Cultural Development, which was created to promote our cultural values. This department plans, coordinates, and executes a wide range of programs that reflect our national culture and history, encompassing disciplines such as theater, music, literature, craft, and folklore. Tawas offers a rich cultural program accessible to all generations, from our historic public square and theater to museums, historic archives, monuments, public art initiatives, and artisan markets. We host a variety of activities that celebrate and enhance our cultural identity. Notable events include the annual book fair, the theater festival, El Bombazo Criollo, the Cahuenos Adoptivos y Centenarios concert, among others, collaborative efforts with the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture, such as Campechada, further bolster our cultural initiatives. This multidisciplinary event celebrates our rich heritage, allowing artisan writers and musicians to showcase their talents, even virtually during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our cultural program not only provides opportunities for artists to express themselves, but also foster creativity, innovation, and networking with their artistic community. Caguas Escultura encapsulates our identity, values, traditions, and customs. It promotes shared experiences, dialogue, tolerance, and a sense of belonging that enriches our local pride. Furthermore, it encourages appreciation for cultural diversity, fostering social cohesion and creating a platform for self-expression and well-being within our society. In conclusion, culture is essential not only for preserving our heritage, but also for nurturing a vibrant, engaged, and inclusive community in Caguas, nuestro no país, centro y corazón de Puerto Rico. Thanks for the opportunity to share this with all of you. God bless you all. Hello and thank you to Mayor William Miranda Torres for his support of the arts in Caguas. It's inspiring to see a mayor speak so eloquently about the value of the arts in his town. As the final piece of business, I'm pleased to announce that the National Council on the Arts has reviewed the applications presented and that a tally of the council members' ballots revealed that all recommendations for funding and rejection have passed. Thank you for joining us today. Having had the opportunity to reflect on all the agency has accomplished in recent years, I remain even more optimistic about the future of the National Endowment for the Arts and the future of the arts in America. Next year marks our 60th anniversary of the NEA. This is a wonderful milestone for the agency and the country. This year will provide us with the opportunity to look at the arc of the agency's contributions and evolution from its inception to its present day. The 60th anniversary compels us to continue to steward the work of shaping the American cultural sector, knowing how critical it is to the vitality of our country and the aspirations we hold dear as a nation. Please follow the work of the NEA on social media and engage with the important work the Arts Endowment is supporting in your communities nationwide. Next National Council on the Arts meeting will be Friday, March 28th, 2025, and it will be live streamed from Washington, DC. Thank you for tuning in. The 214th meeting of the National Council on the Arts is now adjourned.